This message was brought to you by Christian Service. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, and welcome to the Fantasy File Podcast. I am your host, Greg the Scott. You are listening to one of the greatest underground podcasts coming out of the great province of Quebec. Mm-hmm. No, we're not a province, or we're not Quebec. You Quebec, just yes. Quebec, no. Quebec. Quebec. Yes. Well, I'm not French. That's native. Yeah. Well, you don't know how other people are saying it that are listening to the podcast. I might say it all wrong. Wrong. <laughs> They're wrong. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, this podcast comes from the great white north. Canada. The true north. The true north strong and free. Yes. Woo! Used to be. Mm, whoa. Throwing Canada under the bus. So, again, I'm your host, Greg Descott. Just in case you forgot in our ramblings. Fancy File Podcast. Are you ready? Are you excited that you get to listen to us every two weeks? You get to hear my voice, the greatest voice that's not on radio. Mm. Maybe. Maybe one of the greatest voices. Yeah. It's not often enough. For you or for them? For me. Oh. Well, thanks, Rexy. By the way, I am with a great group of co-panelists who are not pianists. They do not play piano yet. Well, somebody actually, Mickey, you might do it a bit, or maybe maybe Melanie. I don't know. Used to. Used to. Used to be. Uh, <laughs> it's gonna make a reference that no one would have got. So, and even in this room, anyways. Uh, so I'm going to tell you who I'm with, which should be no surprise because it's usually the same panelists week in week out, which is good. It creates consistency and it builds a bond between them and the audience, which we very much care about. So first. To my left and your left on the AM FM radio dial. I don't even think we're on the radio, but who knows? We got Marvelous Mick. Mickey, how are you? I'm doing well. Doing very well. Thank you. And you also look very well. Thank you. I am. I've been drinking water. Oh, well. That's an upgrade. <laughs> what type of water, though? Is it like tap water? Is it bottled water? Um, I don't want to do a sponsor of something. Okay. We're not paid yet, but a sparkling water without flavor. Oh, wow. That everyone mistake for uh an alcoholic beverage which you can't do in front of children right but uh, you know that's that's on them that's on them it is on them he's also by the way i mentioned it last week he is wearing the anointed glasses again he's ready to go yes it's not some weird prophetic thing uh well maybe it is a little bit but just we have this thing going between us that back in the 80s a lot of preachers had those big thick glasses and so we like, well, that's the anointed glasses. If you're not wearing it, you weren't anointed. So Mick decided he needed to get some. Yes. And to uh, let my inner Jimmy out. Now that I've said it, <laughs> sounds a lot weirder than I thought it would. Right. <laughs> At least you look anointed. Yeah. So for those of you who are old enough to remember, I mean, J- Jimmy Swagger back in the 80s, Evangelist was on TV. He had those big, thick glasses. Billy Graham. Had those big, thick glasses. David Wilkerson. Benny Hinn. Did he? Uh, do you? Okay, I... We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna move on from that one. Uh, next to Marvelous Mick, we have the Rexosaurus. The Ezosaur, the Rexosaurus. The Ezosaurus Rex. Don't call me Rexy. Rexy. G'day, folks. How are you? I can't complain too much yourself. Good. Did you get that haircut you always wanted? I did. I even cut it myself. Wow. You gave yourself the haircut you always wanted. Of course. <laughs> did you tip yourself well? Always. Good. What's a good tip for a haircut, by the way? What is a good tip? Like, what's a good tip? You spend $15 on a haircut. What's a good tip? Hmm. Are you going up to 20 I usually tip uh, 10%, 15%. So he's giving them a dollar. Here it is. <laughs> you get 16 bucks. Mick, what's a good tip for a hair- haircut? For a haircut. Yeah. Fifteen dollar oh. haircut. What's a good tip? So generally, my brother 
cuts my hair. So he gets, uh, nothing. He gets, he gets my love and affection That's from fair. a distance. That's fair. That's okay. All right. That's fair. Shout out to Mick's brother. Yes, shout Does out he to listen? Will? Will? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. You should ask him next time you see him. Yeah, we'll ask him. Does he even know? No, he knows we're the 12th biggest podcast in North America in our specific field. Is it North America or Canada? It might be the world. Wow. But I wouldn't know. The, the, the list is a bit vague. Now, did they, did, like they, did those people who ranked us listen to it? I'd assume so. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Uh, and also with us again, uh, you heard her. She spoke. She commented. She wowed. And now you're about to be wowed. The Melanie. Ooh. Wow, thanks for the introduction. You're welcome. How are you? <laughs> I'm great. I'm always great when I'm with you guys. Oh, she loves us. I do. I it's, really do. It's great. Yeah. It's nice to be loved. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, the question for you too. What's a good tip for a haircut? Like, Do you cut your own hair? No. Oh, no. I wouldn't be able to. I think it's different for girls. <laughs> <laughs> I was treading on dangerous ground right there. Like, I stepped in. Said it and I got out. Uh, um, fifteen percent. Okay. What? But to be fair, your haircuts are a lot more expensive than ours. They're really expensive. So what? Like, how much are you paying for a haircut? Thirty-five. Oh my gosh! Wow. Okay. For thirty-five dollars, I bought my own hair trimmers. For thirty-five dollars, I got Uber Eats from McDonald's. That's expensive. No, no, I'm joking. <laughs> That's really, but it, to be fair, it probably cost thirty five dollars because of the. That's delivery. his entree. No, yeah, that's just the fries. Because <laughs> I order like fifteen of them. Like, wow. okay. give them to me all. Oh, no. Everyone's looking at me. Oh, that explains it. Yeah, I know, I know. Fat jokes. All right. There's actually more we need to say regarding the podcast, Fancy File Podcast. Uh, there's a few things that you can like and subscribe, and I would like uh, for Rexy to tell you which things to like and subscribe to. Of course, anytime. So, you can follow our Root Facebook page, Christian Service Church, on Facebook. You can also uh, like and follow our Fancy Files dedicated page on Facebook. Uh, And if you want to send us direct messages, ask us questions, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram. We are also on Instagram. We're on Instagram, too? Yes. Who runs that page? Oh, oh the Mr. Mick. Marvelous Mick, okay. Yes, if you want, have any questions regarding faith, if you have any questions about the Fancy Files podcast, just send in your questions to the Facebook and Instagram pages, and we will have someone get back to you, and we may even address your question on the podcast. Potentially. Potentially. Yes, and because we record months in advance almost, from when this is recorded to when you're going to hear this, if you send in a question, it might be months before you hear a response. Of course. We'll probably send you an immediate answer, obviously. Right. But if we do find your question particularly good and we feel people will get lots of like help from that question, we will probably gather a bunch of good questions and put them in a segment on a podcast. So right. please send us your questions. We really do want to help you grow in your faith and we want to answer those questions you may have. Yeah. On that note, you can follow this podcast on Spotify. You can follow this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and of course, my favorite, Rexy Podcast. Oh, not Rexy Podcast. Oh, YouTube Podcast. My bad. YouTube, yeah. And this is YouTube. Go on YouTube. (laughs) Like our YouTube page. Yes. Subscribe. Like, subscribe, (laughs) and put the bell. Hit that bell for notifications. Notifications. And. At the time of listening, you're probably also going to be able to find us on Wisdom. We're still working out the details on that at present, but at some point in the future, we will be available on the Wisdom app. Willie don't know. Wisdom is only available on Apple for now, so I guess if you're going to go on Wisdom, uh, you're probably already on Apple Podcasts, so I guess you could like us twice. That's fair. (laughs) You could be liked twice. You can be liked 30 times. And be sure to leave five stars on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It really helps us to extend our reach and to help other people because it will be more likely to be recommended. So please make sure to leave feedback and comments. So five stars means the best because I put one star so I thought it was number one. Oh, Oh wow. Goodness. Well, that's why we're 12th. (laughs) We've been number one by now. I'm a kid and I'm a kid and I'm a kid. Now, I just want to address this. We, as Christian Service and Fancy Files, we believe very much in, in... 
teaching and preaching the word of God as is. We don't sugarcoat it. Uh, and we're not going to shy away from some, uh, you know, controversial things. That's why we got the files part in there. Like we're, we're going in, we're investigating what the word of God says. And that means that there's going to be things we're going to say that might make some people upsetty spaghetti. But it's not because we want to make people upsetty spaghetti. We might have an episode called upsetty spaghetti episode where it's like we're just going to we're swinging for the fences, but not today. So if you do have an issue with what we say, look, we welcome feedback. You can write us. Uh, maybe you felt we were in being spirited or whatever. Like we look, we're growing, we're learning. We're not professionals. We're also human. Yes. And sometimes we have bad days and it comes across wrong. So wrong. So we want to make sure that you guys, you know, if, if, if you felt, look, you said something or even scripturally, you felt we said something off base, feel free to write us, but don't just come in attacking, right? If you want to be heard, you got to show respect both ways. So if you want to send us messages, we invite that. But please, if it's just like, you know, you just ranting and tearing us down, then we're not really, we don't even know if it's a serious thing or it's just like someone who just doesn't like the Bible or Christianity to begin with. Because you will get people who, you know, their whole disposition is constantly triggered. So, it, you know, there's, oh, look, no, Bibles. <laughs> now I know where to write them. Just please. Come with respect, and we will respond with respect. So that's what I wanted to say. Uh, we're continuing a series today, actually, hopefully, finally wrapping up an 11 part series that we've been going through Colossians. <laughs> I, I'm glad that we've, we've dove in deep. We have no problem with that because, uh, and this is actually, you know, a lot of us, we do our own personal Bible studies as a group together, and this is how we do it. We, we studied through the book of Revelation, and it took us almost a year and a half, and we could have gone a lot longer. Like we were just diving in and we, we asked questions and people like even here, like I ask questions, people respond. So you're actually kind of getting a bit of a, you know, what our own personal Bible study group, Bible study group looks like. Uh, so I said all that to say this, if you don't like long winded things, long studies, I, look, this, this may not be the best podcast for you, but give please, us five stars. Obviously anyway. listen, <laughs> well, maybe we'll change your mind. Well, we want to dive in the word and, and in doing that, we're going to be touching so many different topics. And I think that's really important for the body of Christ is the whole counsel of God and addressing really every, you know, I'd love to go through every topic and, and, and talk about it and share. And, and again, yeah, some things are going to be controversial and we believe that these verses, uh, just talking about sin is going to be controversial. So I just wanted to say that. Uh, so I want Mick uh, to read Colossians 3, 5 to 7, please. Therefore... Put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. Thank you. Okay. So we talked about, like, wow, we've been talking about a lot. Talked about identity in Christ how important that is. If you are just jumping in, I'd suggest go back and listen to these uh, earlier ones in the series where we do address identity. It's very important for you as a Christian to know who you are in Christ. This will help you in your walk in victory. And and it is a constant battle you're going to have to face because our minds are constantly attacked with so much information and you really need to renew and undo Mm -hmm. a lot of what's been done. And it's not just for you. It's all of us, even here. It's not like, oh, we've arrived, you know, we're fully sanctified. Uh, no, we're not. We're, we're still going through this and working this out in our own lives. Uh, and then Paul goes into, this is who you are. Now you can't be this anymore. And he gives that list. And then he goes in a bit deeper. He's like, look, if you live in this lifestyle or manner, okay, there's a problem. Because the wrath of God comes upon children of disobedience. Now, there's a few things I want to look at here. Okay, one, the wrath of God. And a question for the group. What is the wrath of God? How, how would you give that definition? Um, so the wrath of God, to be just very plain and simple, is the position and reaction God has to sin. Like, that's just plainly what it is. Um, mm-hmm. How we define wrath is just how we view his reaction to sin. So uh, I think in the last episode, you know, we were talking about how God is hurt by sin. If anything, I think it goes beyond that. God is just really upset by sin, 
really angry with sin. And I think sometimes when we think wrath, we think like the floodgates open and like it's uncontrolled, undefined. But no, God's wrath is very defined and it is precise, controlled. God is sovereign over all his attributes. And so, um, yeah. So that's how I would define God's wrath. You know, and I like that you bring it up that we, you know, talk about God being hurt. And I want to bring this out. We many times are using anthropomorphic language mm. to describe how God responds. And really, our language is very limited mm-hmm. on how to describe how God feels about things. And even saying feel. Well, I do believe God feels. Like, obviously, he puts that there for us. He's not going to put it there and then work to conclude it's something else. But even at that, he's giving to us in language. So it's on our level to understand him better. And it's even deeper. Like you said, I like that. It's even deeper. Because, yeah, because how can we really use human language to describe it? Because yeah, I think it, it's very, language is incomplete, right? Um, even just from one Bible translation in one language to the translation in another language, um, there's some things from, like, English to French that don't translate as well. And there's definitely a bunch of things from Hebrew and Greek to English that don't translate. And so already... Uh, which is why we love going to the Greek, love going to the Hebrew uh, and Aramaic, because at the end of the day, God used specific words to describe himself, and it helps us understand uh, how he feels and how he expresses himself. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Uh, Any other panelists here would like to throw in, how would you uh, describe wrath? Well, according to the Merriam-Webster dictionary which i have pulled up here (laughs) wrath is one strong vengeful anger or indignation or two retributory punishment for an offense or a crime divine chastisement right so in layman's terms wrath is a very strong deep-seated anger specifically towards injustice and sin It reminds me of the verse that says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And so thank God that he is going to finally entirely implement true justice. And there is going to be wrath for the sinner who has caused evil on this earth. And every victim is going to be vindicated. But like you said, Mick, um, his wrath isn't reckless and so it's calculated he knows exactly what he's doing and he knows who is deserving of punishment and so it's, everything is calculated and so it, it's a blessing um this is controversial because you're like oh wow well how can wrath be a blessing like how can it be a good thing yes explain well, that sin needs to be punished mm. sin needs to be punished and like i said in the previous podcast heaven wouldn't be heaven if there were presence of sin and so, like, thank God that there's going to be no sin in heaven because it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be glorious. It wouldn't be heaven. Right. And so we need God to have the attribute, the attribute of wrath, because otherwise there would be sin in heaven and it would be awful. Right. We wouldn't want to be with Christ if there were a sin in heaven. Like, we wouldn't yes, want and that. The reason that is true is because then the God of the Bible is actually not the God of the Bible. Mm-hmm. We're not actually in heaven with the God of the Bible. Mm. It's a foreign God. Because mm-hmm. this is a God who doesn't punish sin, who excuses, excuses sin away. That's not the God of the Bible. Mm-hmm. The God of the Bible punishes sin and doesn't excuse sin away. Like I, I, I think of wrath. I think of this is God's response. Just response to evil. Mm-hmm. It's his just response. And... Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and and so, someone I I don't know which what if it was Bicker or Ezra, uh, was saying like this deep seated or deep rooted or, or emotion. So you see how God. This is how God responds to sin. Okay, it took. First of all, you see it in Christ. It's it's God that ordained His Son to die in our place. Mm. The Father did that. Okay. So if it took the death of Christ, of his own beloved son, and a brutal death it was, and, re- and taken on the wrath of God, it was so heavy on Christ that he was sweating drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's how heavy it was. 
So if that's God's response to sin, for us as Christians to excuse it away, I believe it is a great insult to the Father. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, if you look at, uh, at this from the point of view that the Bible really presents us the truest and, and most beautiful picture of what God is and who he is, uh, I'm reminded of what a great teacher once said, a great Bible teacher said, that God, a God who is all love, all grace, all mercy, no sovereignty, no justice, no holiness, and no wrath is an idol. And mm-hmm. I think this idea that for us to create a God that is nothing like himself, mm. right? It comes back down to worshiping ourselves. Amen. Right. Um, That's good. You know, I, I think it might have been in crazy love. Uh, when Francis Chan was still, you know, grounded, um, I think he he said something about the along the lines that we end up having this, uh, you know, this is God's universe and he does his uh, he guides it and rules it how he pleases. Uh, we may have a better way, but we don't have a universe, mm-hmm. and so this idea, right, that we can't just choose pick mm-hmm. and choose the attributes that we like, mm. uh, and all of them are intimately linked um you know we, we talk about needing wrath but we actually also you know through justice that is also done um he was saying through love that's done through um the fact that he knows everything the fact that he uh, he is unchanging all those things come to play in god's wrath yeah i like that love Love, love. That, that's important because I think some people would think, well, no, if God is love, he won't be wrathful. But mm. that's not true. If he does love, truly love, then he is going to have a strong response towards that which is evil and will attack mm-hmm. that which is his. Because remember, we're he created us. He created this world. It belongs to him. It's good. Okay? And because it belongs to him and because he is a he's a good God, he's a loving God, he's going to defend that. I think of... Like, you know, obviously on on my perspective, you know, as a man, if I really care for a woman, okay, and it doesn't even have just to be a woman that like I would want to be in a relationship with, even just friends and family, if I really care for a woman, okay, and I see that someone would want to attack that person, I would want to do any, everything to defend that person. That's, and the same thing, like with your children, if you have children, you love your children you are going to do everything you can to defend your children against that which is evil. But if you're not, if you just it, it, let it escape, you know, someone wants to kidnap your kid and you you care more about the kidnapper not offending them than your kids, mm-hmm. you do not love. It is twisted. It is some modern version of love that is not biblical or truly defined uh, in, in modern culture, like actually defined words of love mm-hmm. is the same thing for God. If, if that's our view of God, which many people want it to be, God just lets everything go. If he did, he actually isn't loving at all. Mm. I'm totally on board with what you said. If anyone were to come into this house and threaten my wife or to do unspeakable things to her, they should fear for their life. Because if I didn't do anything to protect or defend my wife from someone who comes in desiring evil, what kind of husband would I be? I would be a coward. I would probably not have a wife anymore. I would be the scum of the earth to sit there and watch as somebody does their evil to my wife, my family. I could not be called loving if I didn't do something Mm -hmm. and intervene and protect my wife. And so it bothers me when people say, well, God can't be loving if he has wrath. He can't be loving if he doesn't punish sin. I, my response is, well, how is that true? Because mm. God loves every individual on this planet. He really does. As I mentioned in the last podcast, God is not willing that any should perish. Mm. And John 3.16, the most quoted verse in the Bible, for God so loved the world. God loves everyone. Yeah. And that is why he, well, it is one big reason why he has wrath towards sin, because his love for the world understands the deep-seated destruction that comes from sin. He sees the injustice that comes from sin. 
He sees the injustice and the destruction that comes upon his creation because of the infection and disease of sin, and that it stirs up his wrath because he knows there is nothing good about this. There's nothing good. There's nothing redeemable about sin, and it drives him to justice through wrath through justice. Hmm. I want to share a um, a study that I'm doing. It's called the Attributes of God, and it was uh, it's it was made by the Daily Grace Company. I really encourage you all to buy this. They have the women's edition and the man's edition, so this is for everyone. And their definition of, of wrath is God stands in opposition to all that is evil. He enacts judgment according to His holiness, righteousness, and justice. And then it also gives our response. And so if God is wrathful, well, we should hate sin also. And um, Mm. we can reflect the image of God by hating sin the way that God does for our own lives, but also when people do us wrong, like we have to hate the sin, but not obviously like we were saying earlier, um, not the sinner. Uh, Well, you were saying yes, uh, in a way, yes, but you know. Um, And so I think we have to display um, the hatred of sin in our own lives when we commit an offense towards God because of how seriously he takes sin to the point that he had to crush his own son for it. And so may God help us see how severe sin really is. Yeah. Now I'm going to say something controversial. So every, all my panelists grab onto something, get ready, get ready for this. Hold on to your butts. That's a Jurassic Park reference, by the way. Um, Shout out to Samuel L. Jackson. <laughs> he didn't make it, people. <laughs> All right. Uh, and I'm not, I don't, I don't, and I want to make sure I say this correctly because I don't want to broad brush. Because even though a lot of people broad brush, they don't like it when others broad brush. Only they can do it. There is within Christian circles, factions across the denominational world and non denominational world that do not and will not teach and preach on the wrath of God. Mm. I'll say that again. Controversial. And I'm not here, I'm not calling out names, I'm not going to say this, people did it, this people did it. But maybe you, listener, in the course of your Christian walk, have come across people, they will not, or even pastors, that will not preach and teach on the wrath of God. They don't like it. They they find it controversial. They don't want to upset people. They, they're worried that maybe people will leave their congregations. This exists. It exists within the church world. They will never, ever address it. And then because of that, they won't even talk about the cross. They don't want to talk about the blood. They won't talk about Jesus dying for our sins in that way. Uh, I don't even know how they can properly teach the gospel without explaining that Jesus died for our sins. Mm-hmm. But I've heard it on TV. I won't say who, but I've heard past, you know, a, a preacher get up. I don't even know if we should call him a preacher, but anyways, gets up and he'll start talking about, I don't know, I don't even remember what the message was, had nothing to do with the gospel, very little Bible verses. And then at the end of his message, he kind of just quickly said, let's just say the sinner's prayer after, and then, you know, we repeat the message, repeat the words. And then, oh, if you said it, you're born again. And I was like, What? had nothing to do with anything but it does exist and maybe even you listening to it you hear the wrath of god and it makes you uncomfortable you don't like that why do you guys think that within christian circles that is the reality in some i think when it comes to the wrath of god like many attributes i think we're under equipped to actually discuss it i think a lot of pastors not to necessarily uh, ignore what they've done. But I think a lot of people, because of the situation we're in, are tossed into ministry. And, uh, you know, before we're ripe enough to do so. <laughs> she said tossed, and I just think of someone being thrown. Oh! <laughs> well, we say that, right? But, like, it's happened. I, I know one of my first sermons was, like, at camp, and I knew I was preaching 15 minutes beforehand. That's being tossed into ministry. Mm. You know, but, so, sometimes these... You preach on what you know well and what you know best. And sometimes, well, it's not wrath. Sometimes it's not, it might be justice. But, you know, sometimes it's not the fact that God is unchanging. Maybe you're ill-equipped to answer to 
all these questions about that the world is now throwing to you, right? When we think about apologetics, which is the study of answering for the faith, well, we we kind of figure out, right, if you look at it historically, it all starts with questions. And apologetics are a much harder field to get into now than they were 100 or 500 years ago for the sole reasons that there are more questions, <laughs> right? At first, it was the existence of God or then the Trinity before then. But then now it's like, well, it comes down to gender. It comes down to the the roles of men and women. And, and I think that wrath is ignored because we're under-equipped and under-prepared to face the realities of ministry and the realities of being a Christian. That's good. Yeah, that definitely could be one of the problems that, that is, is within the church world. And then you end up with this bad cycle. Preacher decides, or preachers, or seminary, or denomination goes in the direction, we are not going to talk about this anymore. So the next generation is not equipped. And then of course, they're not going to talk about it. Alongside that, I, I think part of the problem, as Mick mentioned, is under-equipped. Being under-equipped is very problematic because... You, you don't have what you need to give the right answer. Although it can, if done properly, lead you into learning the process on getting the answers accurately, there's also the problem, especially if these two issues are mixed, uh, there's also the problem of wanting to please people. There is this movement yep. in the Western Church called the Seeker-Sensitive Movement, and it is exactly that, except slightly worse than it sounds. It's not seeker sensitive in that, hey, look, we want to make sure we're not rude. We want to make sure that they don't feel attacked. We want to make sure that they're respected as people. It, it's not that. It's, it's, uh, it's not good. A seeker sensitive movement is, I don't want to say anything that will contradict how they feel about themselves or about life. I'm not going to say anything that will potentially sour their mood or sour their opinion of God. And that includes talking about the wrath of God. That includes talking about controversial issues that the Bible talks about. Like Mick had mentioned, role of men and women in the church, even gender today. Like Genesis 2 and Genesis 1, he made them male and female. That is now controversial. And you'll Very see. controversial. <laughs> oh, it, it's <laughs> it's one of those fancy Italian candles, dinamite. But like, it, it's volatile. It's a very volatile subject now. And so, if you combine people being ill prepared, ill equipped, with the seeker sensitive movement and the idea, I don't want to turn anyone off from the gospel. I don't want to say anything negative because I want them to come to church. I want them to be a Christian. But if you look at Jesus, he actively said controversial things. Mm. Eat my flesh and drink my blood, and that's how you get into the kingdom of God. <laughs> that is controversial. Oh, people left on that one. Oh, yeah. He was left with just the 12 followers. But they stayed because they knew there was a deeper meaning to what he was saying. Yeah. They knew, where else can we go for only you have the words of eternal life? Amen. People love to follow Jesus for what he can give them. The Ooh. miracles, the healings, the crowds. Who doesn't love the miracles, healings, and crowds? Crowds means money. Hey, today, miracles on TV, you know, send me your money and you'll get your miracle. But the minute doctrine shows up, people are out the door. The same is true in churches. Not all of them, again, just so that no one's like, he's broad brushing. It is a single aspect that is important, though. Yeah, of course. And and this, you have churches, they, they love to, like, their entire existence is to serve people. Is You'll have all their, their ministries, outreach. You know, they'll have, they'll have their, their food ministries, their children ministries, their senior ministries, uh, whatever. And are those things bad? No. Churches should have them. But then when it comes to teaching doctrine, well, we want to do it like Jesus does, which is preaching to the crowd. Well, when Jesus started preaching to the crowd and started teaching doctrine, what happened? People left. Mm -hmm. So if you did it like Jesus, you're going to lose people. <laughs> and then so then you end up having these churches that know 
buddy, if that is the case in that church, is hearing the word of God, is, is hearing the, the full counsel of God. Yep. It's very, very dangerous. And those types of churches, I know people won't like hearing this. And again, I'm not giving names. I'm not saying this church does it, this church does it. it. But those type of churches, run. Mm. Run. Yep. Because people are not going to get saved. Oof. Okay? Yeah. People are not going to grow. Mm. It's just going to be, it will be a nice place Mm -hmm. where they may be doing good works, but the gospel is not being taught and God is not being glorified because it's a two way street. You need the two tracks and you need to have, yes, you do the good works. Yes, yes, do them. But you also preach the truth Mm. because if you don't, you only have one track down and that train ain't going anywhere. But when you study preaching, the call to action always comes after the declaration of the gospel. Mm. And I think it's easy, especially if you're in an area that's needy, right? Where there's a lot of poverty or whatever, where you jump the gun and you just straight ahead call your people to action to more giving, more serving. When in reality, you know, the call of the gospel should come first. Well, just look at look at Acts. Okay, uh, Acts when Jesus, before Jesus ascended to heaven, mm-hmm. okay, he said he told his followers, "You wait till you receive the Holy Spirit." But the Holy Spirit isn't given to the world; salvation is given to the world, right? You get saved, and then you get the Holy Spirit. That's Pentecostal teaching there. But uh oh, trigger warning: we are Pentecostal. Well, some of us are Pentecostal. <laughs> but look, they didn't. Don't even leave. Don't go do anything until you receive the Holy Spirit. Mm. Okay, so people need to be saved. Mm -hmm. Then you go out and you do the ministry of Christ. Mm -hmm. But in the continuation of the ministry of Christ, as we are the body of Christ on this earth, it's not only the miracles and the good works that Jesus did that we do. We are to do it. But it's the teaching of the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. That is what is important. And unfortunately, when the kingdom of God is taught, when the word of God is taught, when the gospel is taught, People will leave. Why? Is it because of how you said it? If that's the case, then Jesus is to be blamed as the worst church growth person ever to walk this earth. Do you really want to go up to Jesus and say he was wrong? Was he ever outside the will of God? Mm. Not once. If that's your theology, it is wrong it is wrong. It is wrong. You are serving a false Jesus. Okay? The Jesus of the Bible taught the word of God. He preached the word of God faithfully. He never deviated. And yes, he is the embodiment of love. He is the most loving person to ever walk this earth. Mm-hmm. And even the most loving person to ever walk this earth had people that forsook him, that left him. Hey, they want, they crucified him. Mm-hmm. They didn't crucify him because he was throwing flowers at people and saying, "Come, come, just, just woohoo!" You know, tickle, tickle. Here's a miracle. Here's a miracle. There's a miracle. Miracles for all. No, he said things that really upset his spaghetti. Those people. I mean, he looked at the Pharisees right in the eyeballs and said, "You are graves." Mm. Pretty much. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying go around and, and, and saying that to people, but Jesus said things that really ruffled feathers. Why is it that the church, when it talks about being like Jesus, likes to ignore what Jesus actually did and oh, said? Amen. Not all of them. Not all of them. If you're a pastor, I'm not saying that you're doing this. If you're faithfully preaching the word and the numbers aren't coming in, keep preaching the word. Be <laughs> faithful to the Lord. It is better that you be faithful to the Lord and your church goes down amen. than you compromise and you get rich. Mm. So keep preaching the word of God. Don't give up. Don't quit. Keep seeking him. Do not be like those who've gone down the road of compromise and ignore things like wrath because it will upset some people. Mm. I don't know if anyone else wants to add something to that. Yep. I Rexy? Mean, Paul said it, right? I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Mm. Right? Like, if we compromise on the gospel, we're compromising on God's power. If you remove a couple pieces out of the engine of a car, it no longer has power. And if it 
uses its power, it's going to explode. If you remove anything from the gospel, you are crippling its power. And you're not preaching the gospel anymore. The gospel is very simple. Man was created perfect in God's eyes. Sin came and corrupted the world. Man now has a sin nature. They are evil from their very core. Yeah. And they are damned to hell for their sin. But Christ came and took the punishment for our sin so that if we turn to him and in faith say, Christ took my punishment and we serve him with our lives, he regenerates us and we are now made right with God. Amen. If you don't talk about sin, if you don't talk about wrath, you've lost the point of Jesus. Mm. If there's no sin, why do I need Jesus? If there's no yeah. wrath of God, why did Christ die on a cross? Yeah. What is the point of Jesus if there is no wrath and no sin? If there's no wrath, then I can do whatever I want because there's no wrath for sin. Mm. We need to know that there is wrath. We need to know that there is a consequence to sin. Otherwise, the gospel is totally useless. Yeah, I want to say this quickly because I know there's going to be the yeah buts people that are listening. But I do want to say this, okay, because I know that it, we will be misinterpreted. One, we're not saying that you need to go and be rude. There are preachers out there who are rude and unkind mm. preaching sound doctrine. Mm. They're preaching sound doctrine, but they're really mean. Mm. Do not be mean, okay? Those churches, they go to the opposite end. Mm -hmm. They're just... Every week, condemning, condemning, condemning. We're not saying doing that. You need to preach the whole counsel of God. It's not every week, you know, death and condemnation, death and condemnation. You know, we want to make sure because we know people. Are, yeah, but, you know, I went to this church and they were really unkind. I believe that. I know that is true. So we're not saying that be like that. You need to have the sensitivity of the spirit. You need to be walking in love. You need to be walking under the anointing of the Holy Spirit because when you are preaching on these things, it's, remember, it's not you. You aren't convicting and convincing people to come in. That's the problem. I think some of these churches think it is them, so they need a soft message to manipulate people into their buildings. Ooh. No. You preach the word, and it is the Holy Spirit that draws them. Unless the Spirit draws them, they will not come. Mm. the word of God, the promise is given. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Not some men, not a few men, all men. Lift up the name of Jesus and trust that the Holy Spirit, because that's when the call comes. In the preaching of the gospel, men and women are drawn to the truth. And on the point of what you were saying regarding rude pastors and pastors being genuinely mean, like, they are in the wrong. Christ mm. has already told them they're wrong. Because mm. in, in the Gospels, when he sends out the church, what he says is, be wise as serpents, but innocent as doves. That's so good. yes, you are to be direct and say, no, this is sin, but you are to be gentle. We're to love the world, the, the people in the world, not the world as a concept. Like, mm -hmm. We're supposed to love people. And part of love is to point out sin, but there is a right way and a wrong way to do it. And Christ says it right here, be gentle as doves. I'm someone, like Greg said, I don't know when he said this, but I'm someone who is a defender of the faith. And so for me, speaking the truth is extremely important. And I feel like the Holy Spirit gives me grace to sometimes know like what kind of person I'm talking to because sometimes I know that with one type of person I could say one thing and they would get it and then with another it's going to be something different but it's right. still going to be the same message right like I'm not gonna like sugarcoat things it's still going to be the same message but my approach is going to be different and so that goes into apologetics too where it's like um it's going to be the same message but it's just going to be brought differently yeah. and so I think there's that that comes with it too, that the Holy Spirit like really equips us to 
speak the truth faithfully and to not shy away from it, to speak it in love. But speaking it in love doesn't mean it's not going to ruffle feathers. It doesn't mean that it's not going to offend people because I've had people who told me that they were straight out offended, but later they came back to me and they were like, you know what? You're right. I didn't like the way you said it maybe because you used this word, you said this, but you were right. And so people get offended because it is the truth. Yeah. And, and you'll have, and there's a maturity process too for the believer. Like I, I remember there was a ministry that, uh, you know, when we were younger, we were in ministry and we were, we could be a little more like, whoa. And then as time went on, um, you know, if we thought we offended somebody, we would reach out and be like, did, did we offend you? What was it that we said? We always wanted to make sure, is it that we spoke the word of God and the word of God offended you or was I a jerk? Mm. You know, so that that's where that maturity process comes it's in. Good. Uh, verse seven, and then I want to close. Uh, in the which ye also walked some time when you lived in them. Paul reminds the believer that that list, those sins, you, Christian, used to walk in it. And we got to look at it a few ways. One, and I love how he kind of, I don't want to say because there's more that he gives, but we're not going to get into that. But for us in this podcast, one, it reminds us who we were, but what our identity is now. Our old identity was that in sin. It talked about children of disobedience under the wrath of God, but not now. Now your life is hidden in Christ. Now you're seated above, you know, you're hidden in, in heavenly places and, and, and so much more that the word of God says. That's your identity now, what you were, not what you are. That's important to remember. Brother and sister in Christ, mm -hmm. if you fall to those sins, because you can and will. I know that's not popular, but Christians fall into sin. Yeah, I do believe you get to the place where you walk in victory. I know some Christians won't teach that. Uh, and then you'll have other Christians who will be like, ah, oh, you're totally sanctified. You'll never, ever sin again. Mm -hmm. Congratulations, you made it to heaven. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we are going to struggle. But even in that moment when we fall to those sins, that doesn't define you. You are still what the Bible says you are in Christ. Amen. Okay. Preach. Thank you. But because of that, because of what you were, there is still the possibility that that can come in, like I said, and show up, but also cause problems for you. Yeah. And if a Christian isn't careful, they can get entangled again. The Bible warns us about not doing it. The Bible warns us about not falling back into sin. If it weren't possible, those warnings wouldn't be there. If it were, because why would he say it? Is he just saying it to shoot the breeze? I want to tell you something. Just want to speak? No, he warns you because you can shipwreck your faith, it's because good. you can get off course, because you can get lukewarm, because you can backslide. And and in some cases, people who do that, they they fall away completely, mm. and that is one hundred percent scary. Mm. Is that what you want? Do you want to shipwreck your faith? Do you want to be known as someone that was really passionate for God, but then ran off because you couldn't get self-control and you you weren't following what the what the Bible said? But how does it all start? It starts with identity. Know who you are. Mm. Change your thinking. If your thinking is always negative, you, how are you going to get victory? Yeah. And I know, change your thinking, Greg. Well, that, that's easier said than done. I know that. But you don't just change your thinking by one day being like, well, I'm going to change my thinking. Maybe mm -hmm. to a degree, yes, positive mm -hmm. steps. Read the word of God. Amen. Renew your mind. Your yeah. mind needs to be yeah. renewed. It's almost like, you know, there's a virus on the computer and you need to erase it and you do a hard reboot. You need to do a hard reboot on your brain. Yeah. On your thoughts. Yeah. Uh, as we're closing this podcast, I just very, very quickly, people, in just a few few sentences to the audience that needs to something to be reminded. What is something that they need to be reminded that we taught them in this podcast very quickly? Mickey. Well, the first uh, few words of verse five are therefore put to death. And this idea that um, we have our part to play. Uh, you know, the therefore is because of what Christ has done, we must go forth and do everything we can in order to cut the sin out of our lives. And obviously we're promised that the Holy Spirit will help us through it. Amen. But we need to set out to do it. And it has nothing to do with salvation. It has mm. everything to do with sanctification. Mm. Amen. Mm. Rexy. Well, 
I'm going to pull right from the beginning of this series and say, we got to remember that our identity is grounded in Christ. We got to remember that ultimately we don't have to achieve anything to get to heaven. We just have to put our trust and our hope in him. So good. And Melanie? Yeah. So we were saved out of those sins. Like we were saved from that. And so to honor Christ's sacrifice on our behalf, I think we have to meditate on scripture, like you said, renew our minds so we don't fall back into that because you're going to sin again Mm. and you're going to fall into it, but there is victory. And like you said, Mick, the Holy Spirit empowers us. Amen. Well, that concludes our 11 podcast series on identity. I want to thank you. Next time that we come in, we're going to have a new series. Uh, So I am your host, Greg the Scott. Today I had with me Marvelous Mick. Thanks for having me. Mr. Rexosaurus Rex. Always a pleasure. And the Melanie. Bye. Meditate on scripture. Thank you, everyone, and God bless.